So what are things to look for? And I call these subtle things mm, because some of the things that like some people don't talk about these things. And I learned these things as a woman in the job side. It's very different when my husband is in the job side, the treatment is different. So I, I sort of created a list of things that are important for me to look at or to look for um, to help me make the decision whether to hire somebody or not. So are they clean? Is the job site clean? How does their crew look like? Do they, do they look happy? Do they look unhappy? Are they disgusting? Um, are they like, I had a guy walk to me once and uh, I think he was like, he was gonna ask me a question about the job and then he lifted his t-shirt and he showed me his big belly and I was like, well, <laughs> that's really not very nice. I really didn't need to see that. So that's something that um, I pay attention to. Are there tools all over the place? And that goes back to is the job site clean? Because when at the end of the day, when they go home and you want to show your private money guy your current project and the job is a mess, it's not a reflection of the contractor. It's a reflection on you because your PML doesn't know who that contractor is, right? So you would really need to own that own the entirety of the project is my point. Um, how do they speak to each other? Are they, you know, some people swear and that I'm fine with swearing on the job side, you know, in certain, certain times, but are they like completely losing their cool sometimes? Do they throw stuff at each other? Um, and how do they speak to you? How do they treat you with respect and um, professionalism? That's super important. Also, so I call this the four C's, clean, cool, capable, and caution. Now for cool, you know, it's a pleasant, this, is this person pleasant? Is this person, is this gonna be nice to work with? Are they cool, right? So, or are they overbearingly explaining things? Like sometimes they, when they see a woman in the job site or they see somebody, a guy that's new and they just absolutely take over and it's my knowledge and I'm like dumping this on you and this is the way you need to do things. And then they try to teach you how to do it these are people that are, in my opinion, are not very flexible. And when you're learning and when you're trying to, to take control over, the, over your business um, and not give control over to the general contractor, uh, which costs you more if you hire a general contractor, then uh, you, know, you can't have somebody that, that, is, that is like that. Um, they need to be flexible, right? Because things happen. And uh, sometimes you can't, you didn't close on the day you were supposed to close. And so you have to postpone everybody and you have to push your crew back a week or two weeks or, you know, with coronavirus right now, there's, there's, there's a lot going on. So, you know, if people, if people aren't flexible, um, it's going to be very hard to work with them. Are they rushed when, when, if you visit their job site, are they rushing you through it or are they not showing you things or are they hiding certain things or, do they want to teach you? Like, are they uh, open? Do they show up on time? That's super important because if they say they're going to be here on Monday at nine and it's, it's Monday at three and they don't even return your calls, then you know you can't work with that guy. And their demeanor, it, you know, it goes back to the guy with the big belly and the t-shirt and the cleanliness and everything all together. So you can actually like kind of mix this all together are they capable so are they trustworthy do they seem to want to build trust um and that is that goes also along the lines of um sales guys so a lot of a lot of contractors are not good salespeople. um but if they are good salespeople, they will be absolutely charming and agreeable and nice and then once you start the job they may become jerks so you have to put your radar like sharpen your antennas and try to like, you know, like see is, can I trust this person? Because at the end of the day, there's a lot at stake for you, the investor. There's a lot of money there. And this guy, if he doesn't finish the job uh, and he takes his crew with him, then what are you gonna do? Do they seem to know their stuff? Do they know their trade? A lot of, out here on the island, I've met a bunch of people or subs that come to the job they say well such and such told me that you were looking for whatever so i'm like yeah who oh i don't remember and because they stop at the job site they see that there is a job site that there's people working and they just show up 
And there's people trying to get work. I understand that. But you need to hire a professional unless you have a very good handyman. Like I can consider Phil, my husband, a really good handyman. Like he can take on a lot of things. And I'm, I'm really grateful and lucky for that. But if you don't, then you, but one good thing is that you are going to need to find someone like that as you move forward in your business. But you also need to hire a professional because you don't want this have rehabbed because you, you're not going to half sell the house at the end when you're done. Are they team players? Are they going to put the t-shirt of the company and be like, yay, absolutely for you. Uh, or are they going to be jerks? And do they force their knowledge on you? It's like my way or the highway or nothing at all. So those are kind of like the things that I look for, uh, that I like to find. And then where I'm very cautious is where they, they don't have a license. And it's very easy for you to find if they have a license or not. They give you their company name. You can look it up in the county records and, and you can find them. And you can find, especially in like Nassau and Suffolk County, you can find on Long Island, you can find if they have complaints and what the complaints are. If they don't have insurance, if you lose your insurance, the insurance company notifies the county and the county cancels your license. So one thing goes with the other. No references, it's on response and they don't answer the phone. I don't know how many times I, I've called agents or um, contractors as well and no one answers the phone and it just is, it's just unprofessional or they don't return calls. So they say, I'll give you an estimate tomorrow and it's next week and guess what? I still don't have it. So that's someone you don't want to work with. They are unpleasant. You just basically, there's no chemistry. You don't like them. They, it doesn't feel like they want to be on your team. It feels like they want to be on their team and they cut corners. And with that, it's very important that you make sure that these people are not going to cut corners and for things that you don't know, for things that you actually, what you don't know, you don't know, right? So there's things that, that they are going to do that you are assuming that they will do for you because the job requires it, because this, this is code, this is how the house is built, and they actually don't do it. And I'll give you an example of that. There was um, a woman investor who thought she had a lot of experience and she had a network of people that she liked to work with, but she couldn't be in the job site all the time. So we were the people there to help her project manage the rehab. And she brought a guy who, as soon as I saw the guy, I was like, well, this guy, this guy is not licensed. That's for sure. And if he's not licensed, he doesn't have insurance. Um, and I didn't like him, but she wanted us to hire him to do the siding. And in the three sentence contract, what they had agreed to was to do the, to, to fix some of the plywood, fix some of the, remove the entire siding, the old siding, fix some of the plywood, put the water barrier, and then put the vinyl siding. And I asked the guy and I said, where is the tie bag? Where are you going to put, sorry, not the, he wasn't going to put the water barrier. He, um, he put the water barrier, he wasn't going to put the insulation. So where was the tie bag? Like, where is the line item where you're going to insulate this? And he was like, well, I, I spoke to the client, your client, and we decided that we don't need that because it's going to cost less. And actually, a lot of houses are built like that, so you actually don't need that. And I was like, well, I'm not, I can't hire you. So when you're doing project management or construction management, you do the hiring for, on behalf of the client, and the client signs the contract, pays the invoices, and you sign as well, and you approve them. So it was a combination of her decision making and my decision making. And in my contract with them, I said, it, it, it is stated that we provide advice and we provide the best recommendation for the job. And this wasn't the best recommendation for the job. So this guy in my book, he can't, he can't never work with us because this is a guy that likes to cut corners. And my client finally understood that and she moved on and she ended up paying what she needed to pay to get the job done right. So that brings me to this question that I get, you know, asked a lot of times, like, what kind of boss are you? Are, are you, um, do you have a full-time job? And that is, you, that is what you do from nine to five. And you want to flip houses or you have um, a property that you want to work on, but you can't be there all the time. 
or are you um, full time committed to running your business and you're going to project manage all of your projects? So you basically become the general contractor. And that, that distinction is important because it will, if, if you don't doubt, if you hire a general contractor, does delegating the work is going to cost you the time of that contractor, you know, whatever third of the, of the cost or what, whatever they decide that they make. Um, so once you're able to decide who you want to be uh, or who you can be, then uh, you understand where you can save some money or where your, why your cost is higher when you hire a general contractor. So, if you hire a general contractor, you understand that you're delegating when you can be there. You have to understand the responsibilities of this guy and you have to write them down and make sure that, that those are explicitly defined. You have to understand the responsibilities of the investor. So you, what are your responsibilities? Because just because you hire the guy, then you're like, well, he's working on it. I'm just waiting for it to be done and I don't need to do anything. And that's a mistake because you're managing the manager at this point. So you can't let go of that. You have to always be in control, even if you are delegating. Um, and understand the different parties that make up your team. That's the only thing that overlaps with both types of boss, what I call boss in this case, is understanding the different parties that make up your team. Now, if you're acting as a general contractor, um, like, like we do for our project, so we project manage every aspect of the job, from the billing, from the 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 rehab draws, uh, who we hire, lien waivers, everything, insurance, everything, contracts. Understand your responsibilities as GC and investor. So you, you actually have a dual role and you hire and vet your subs. So what is this team composed of? Um, I like this slide because, because some people like to uh, say, well, I have a general contractor, so they bring everybody and I don't need to, I don't need to do anything. Um, but the general contractor is licensed as a general contractor, which means that they can hire subcontractors. So they're, they're contracting, whether this general contractor does nothing and it's sitting behind a computer on Excel, or it's actually a framer acting as a general contractor, uh, this person can only do certain things. This person cannot be an electrician and cannot be a plumber unless they are also licensed electricians and licensed plumbers because those guys get licensed separately. And it is important to know that because you can hire a general contractor and you can bring in an electrician that you like and you can bring in a plumber that you like and pair them together. So you're not paying overhead for the electrician for the general contractors electrician and the gc's plumber you can in that case you can bring your guy um and you also are going to need in most municipalities as far as i know you're going to need uh, a permit for the electrician which he files he or she files and same thing for plumbing. Sometimes you get in your permit, you can get your uh, plumbing permit along with your building permit. And, uh, and at the end, the, the, the uh, certificates, particularly for the electrician, are delivered by the electrician. So this is like, a, the electricians and plumbers are like a guys on their own. Um, the subcontractors are hired by the general contractor. If you are the general contractor, then, then you hire your painters, your tile guys, your framers, um, the people that install your sheetrock, your flooring, and all of those guys. And there's uh, also your HVAC people, so heating and cooling, which are some companies. You can find plumbing companies that also do uh, HVAC, and sometimes they're separate. I have one that they do both and they are phenomenal. And I save a ton of money by hiring just one guy to do all of it because I don't have to separate the cost for domestic water and, and, and putting in a new boiler and all the baseboards while I have somebody else looking at the, um, at like central air, for example. So what is a rehab process? So I have this slide here. Uh, 
that basically shows a, a timeline and, and and what are the things that are that you need to um, add into um, this phase. So the before, the while, and after the rehab. So one of the things that we like to do as a company for our clients and for our projects is that as soon as we get under contract, um, we look for all the information that we need to get a building permit. And we, because we typically buy uh, foreclosures or house um, properties that, ha that are auctioned at the steps, we have 30 days to close. And we use those 30 days to do a lot of work that a lot of people start doing the day that they close because they think that they can't do it. So we uh, ensure that we have access to the property um, before closing. And it's, it's not that difficult to get access to the property before closing. And you can get it uh, inspected. We have a guy that we like for short sales and he provides these wonderful um, documents that have absolutely everything that is wrong with the property with um, sort of his estimate, but we pay for those. And that's, if that's a different, uh, uh, in that case it's different because we, we're looking to close on that short sale. Um, so we do pay for it. But before um, you close on a property, if you don't want to spend that money, sometimes they run for $300, $400. I wouldn't spend it. But have somebody come in and inspect the property. If you're buying as is, whatever is in the inspection report doesn't matter because you can't use that to leverage your purchase price. But you can use that to inform you of the repairs that the property needs. And then you write down what you're looking for. So you're defining the scope, you're sketching it, you're writing it, whatever it is that you need to do, document it. And look at it from, from this point of view, you're looking, at things that can be repaired, that can be renewed, and that can be replaced. Not everything needs to be rehab, needs to be a gut rehab, though we do gut rehabs, we love them. But sometimes you can save a lot of sheetrock. Sheetrock lasts a very long time unless it gets wet or it gets mold. So um, think about it that way. And then go to the town, call the building department and research all the requirements that you need because sometimes that takes a while. Um, and if you have to start architectural drawings because there's a, a foundation problem or structural or you're going to change the layout and the town requires them. Some towns, like the town of Brookhaven out here on Long Island, they, for, for some of the work that you need to do, they allow people to just sketch on a piece of paper. Like the homeowner can draw what they want to do. And for some other type of work, that same municipality requires that you bring architectural seal drawings. Um, so you can do all of this legwork before you close in the property and be ready the day that you close with all of this paperwork. And while you're doing that, you can vet and hire your contractors, you write your scope of work, you start your master schedule, which will have draw requests if you're using someone else's money um, and they're not giving it to you in full, and, but they're giving it to you in draws and uh, a payment schedule for what you envision this would be with your GC and the subs and your job progress so you understand when your project will be completed. So is this a six week rehab? Is it a 12 week rehab and et cetera. Um, and at the same time, when you are at the building department, you could go to code enforcement and find any liens or garbage or you know, whatever things that cost money uh, but hopefully you've done this before because that will change your, your uh, purchase price, the, how much you offer on the property if you have to pay any liens or, or other things where, you know, if there's missing COs that they cost money, you have to pay penalties and such. So look for all those things in your due diligence. And the day you close, that day or the day after, you can show up at the town and you've already done so much work. Like I, I can get a, a building permit same day in Brookhaven because I know this process like with my eyes closed. Now the phase of rehab, this, I think this is the most important slide in this entire presentation because it breaks it down into four phases and I always advise people to break it down into phases so that they can understand 
how to like control it and, and, and where the money is going. So your phase one, um, at the end of, let's say at the end of phase one, you can pair this with like a payment to your um, general contractor. And it's, it's one payment of four payments that add up to a hundred percent of the contract. And in there too, you can decide when you're going to get a draw request. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you a slide afterwards that shows how you could do that. So in phase one, what we typically do is you trash out, you clean the place and put everything out, furniture, you know, whatever it is, carpet, whatever it is. Um, you do your electrical and plumbing safe ops, you call the electric gas and water companies and you demo. After you demo, you do your repairs, water, fire damage, or structural. And for that, you're going to need to have the right people to do it, especially if you're, if you're fixing a load bearing wall or you're, or you're changing the layout and you need to put a beam in the middle of the property so it doesn't fall. Uh, a handyman can't do that and, the, and that is part of framing. While you're doing the framing, you could do the roof. If you need to do the roof, this is basically the steps for a gut rehab. So there are things in here that you may not need to do. And after framing, you have to verify all of the layouts for kitchen and bath so that when your plumber and your electric come and start working, they can, um, you, they can start the rough. So once they start the rough and you decide to change the layout, it's going to cost you more money because then you have to change what they've already roughed in. You have then um, these guys start electrical, HVAC, and plumbing rough. You install your siding, your windows, and then you have your town or building department's rough inspection. What I advise too is that if, you, if you're hands-on, you obviously will, will do the inspection yourself with the town. But if you're not, and you can be there, it's a great learning opportunity because you're walking the job site with the town inspector and your GC and, and you know, they ask questions or you ask questions. And, you shouldn't ask certain questions in front of the, of the building department. I would say that like um, things that would trigger the, the guy to be like, well, I'm going to fail you in this inspection because you haven't done this. Like don't ask your GC, like why haven't we done this? But it's an opportunity for you to walk the job and see and make sure that the GC showed up for the inspection. Because if you move from this inspection, you can move the project forward. If you can move the project forward, then you're stuck until any, anything that in the inspection report that needs to be fixed is done. And that will ensure that you get your seal at the end of the project. Phase two, once you've passed rough, is the time to order vanities, appliances, uh, but mostly vanities, and cabinets, and, and all those things. Because like where I am, sometimes those things take about four to five weeks to arrive. So you need to make sure that when you're ready to install cabinets, that they are in the job site. And, not, and that's, not, that's not when you start ordering them. Um, then you do your insulation, you have your insulation inspection from the town. Insulation sometimes takes one day to install, so you can have an inspection this week and then have the next one following week. And then you, you start sheetrock. After you do sheetrock, phases three and four go really fast because then it's, everything gets installed, floors, interior work gets installed um your carpet your your trim your moldings your doors uh you, you finish all the tile in the kitchen and the baths you install everything and you have the plumbing and the um electrical finish and then you have your final inspection i we we, we like to install the front door right before final inspection because it typically if you if you do it before it typically gets beat up and people don't have the same um uh let's say consideration for your things than than you do this is at the end of the day it's a product that you're selling and if the front door is dented or something then uh it's not good and if you haven't started landscaping um you know it's the right time to do it and you could do you know driveways walks walkways decks and patios those things for the most part, don't need permits unless you're doing a raised deck over, I think it's um, 18 inches or I don't remember right now, uh, that you need a separate permit or is part of your building permit. So 
So those are the phases of rehab. And then after the rehab, you reconcile the project and you ensure that your plumber and your electrician submit their request for final uh, inspection. So your town inspection is separate from that final inspection for plumbing and electric. And unless they do that, you're not going to get a CO at the end. You can get the electrical certificate from the electrician. Uh, and sometimes you have to pay them before they can deliver the certificate because it's not up to them, it's up to the town. And we feel comfortable paying them after the job has been completed and all the paperwork is in, lien waivers have been signed, and we haven't received the, the certificate, the electrical certificate for, to submit for CO um, because the town is still thinking about it. Um, so you, you're gonna find yourselves in that situation. Then you submit all the paperwork to get your final CO. You may need a final survey, depending on what the town requires and what you've done. And then you, you reconcile all of the costs. I'm gonna show you in a minute a spreadsheet um, on how we do it. And you're gonna, you need to analyze how, if it's affecting your final profit or not. But if you've been doing a good job throughout the six or 12 weeks that the project lasts, then you know, at the end of every week, you know where you are in your budget. Uh, you can get your warranties from manufacturer from materials that are transferable. Labor is not warrantied. It's, it's warranted to you, but not to the end buyer who buys the foot from you. So that's something that you need to keep for yourself um, and not offer it to your buyer and the warranties for appliances. So you can give the, the buyer the warranties from the manufacturers, but the labor was uh, warranted to you. Sometimes you need, as contractors, we, we do sometimes, uh, we haven't done one yet, but sometimes we've had to discuss a whole harm, hold harmless clause, which means that, like in the case of the Tyvek contractor that didn't want to install it, where uh, the client, if the client, our client had pushed to get that guy on board, then we would have had the client or the investor sign the hold harmless clause. Because when that flip sells and that something happens to that house um, and the buyer comes after the investor, then the investor comes after the GC and we don't want that. So cutting corners is not an option. And the last thing I do with the contractor is, or the subs is to, especially plumbing and electric, is to help, have them help me create a, a cheat sheet that I give our agents that list our houses to use them at open houses. Because sometimes you'll find that buyers show up at your open houses and they ask your agent, oh, what's, uh, what was done to this property? It's beautiful. Tell me about it. And they're like, well, I think they, they changed the kitchen and they put new tile and and then they some paint and you know, like you see there's like new windows and that's all they say. And they don't understand why you spent a hundred thousand dollars in this gut rehab and all of the things that came with it. So you you have all new plumbing, all new electric, new roofing, windows, siding, flooring, you name it. So this cheat sheet is very, it helps the, the agent, the realtor, answer the difficult questions that only you as the investor would know the answer to or your general contractor would know. And it, it, it takes away the nervousness and the, and the awkwardness. So they'll just give this, this sheet of paper to the buyer and then it also helps with the appraisal at the end when they are, the end buyer is getting they're lending in place and they need to, the, the property needs to appraise. Um, you can use that information or the buyer can use that information for the appraiser. Unless the appraiser asks you, the, the investor or the contractor to give that information, then you can do a lot of like a three, four page document with more details. 